Welcome back to the show. This is Phil Vischer. This is the Phil Vischer Podcast. Pod, what is it? Podcast. Podcast. I'm here with Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Hi, who is lovely in, that's not just orange, that's like tangerine. I love that. It's tangerine. Or, Let's yeah, go with okay. that. Let's go with tangerine. I don't see tangerine. What do you it's, see? It's more red. Oh, your eyes are it's really... It's more red. It's, it's more of a salmon um, No, you, know, you say salmon about everything. I do. <laughs> That's very, your go-to color. very for fish amb- fixated. Ambiguous warm <laughs> colors. They're all salmon. Whatever. <laughs> Ed Sky Jatani. I'm here. Who's, now your t-shirt, would you say that's salmon? No, that's red. Oh, that's red. Okay. That's red. I was just checking. I, I think it's a bull's... No, Blackhawks. Black, you're wearing a Blackhawks t-shirt. Go Hawks. Yeah. Oh, okay. no, they're out. But they're out. They lost. I know. Yeah. So sad. So is that the only thing you had clean, or are you mourning I just, the Blackhawks? I just grabbed... It's an undershirt. What are you going to do? Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hi. And Christian, too. Hi, Phil. We've got no guests because we don't need one here for you. But my mom's here. Hey, Christian's mom is in the studio audience. Hi, Hi Vicky. Hi, Christian's mom. Hey, it's a podcast, so in here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so I told you before we started the podcast and we got into two good conversations. Yeah, but we can't just jump right into both of those. I but, know, but I've already but, forgotten what they are. Well, one was Sky's writing a new uh, ebook. It's it's pretty much done. I'm copy editing it. Oh, I'm he's copy editing a yeah. new ebook. Yeah. Which is called Oh, we don't know what it's called. We're well, gonna have the voters help us. The voters. <laughs> the voters. Oh of wow. America. The listeners. <laughs> the listeners. I, I don't have a title quite yet for it, but it, the working title is the Voting Booth Vision. Okay, so what's this and about? And I, I can't pull up the manuscript to tell you what the subtitle is. But you did uh, write it. It should be in your... It's there somewhere. Very There's big a brain. I think it's something like uh, so we a, need Christian, to com- a Christian wrestling with post-Christian culture. So I forget what it is. Oh, but boy. It, yeah, we're, that's not very... No, sad. I don't we're know what trouble. it is. It's, it's, yeah, it needs help. The, the need title needs help. Better. So how about Your Best Life Now? <laughs> it's not that already how about, a book. How about Your Best Life is Over? No. See, how about this, the end of Western again, civilization? Your innate cynicism <laughs> is tripping up your uh, professional success. Probably. Yeah. Probably. All right. Well, tell us what it's okay, about. Okay. So here's the background. I did a talk a number of places over the last couple of years about how Christians engage the culture, and I knew I wanted to take that talk and make it into an ebook, but I didn't want to just make a preachy ebook that's sky spouting off about you know whatever. So I decided to be a little bit more creative and I converted the ebook into a dialogue between like between a senior demon and a junior demon kind of okay. it's a little bit more dickens than S- Lewis. So senior uh, Republican con- con- uh, convention official versus a junior Republican convention official. How's that more Dickens? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean when you say more Dickens? Well, you, if you, the Christmas Carol, if you remember, you know, right. Scrooge with the three right. spirits, the three ghosts, yeah. Christmas, past, present, future. More so, ghostly? We can't do that in the Christian world. We don't do ghosts. So ghosts I have the limits. story begins Give with him a minute. my main character's name is Christian. Oh, I love that. And the other one's Phil. <laughs> <laughs> the the demon one. is Phil. <laughs> yes. And he has a ukulele uh, to torment people. So, no, no, Christian. Because you remember Pilgrim's Progress. Yes, Christian, very well. You know, it's just kind of yes. yeah. the Christian puts and, themselves. And Sister in. Christian, the great song right. from the 80s. Uh-huh. Love that song. So it begins with Christian goes into the, the uh, election polling station, whatever those things are called, mm-hmm. to vote. But has no idea who he's supposed to vote for. It's a polling place, and inside there's a voting booth. And there's a voting booth, yes. right, yeah. Okay. And so he goes into the voting booth, and, it, and he's kind of, it's just a couple paragraphs at the beginning, not sure how to vote, doesn't know what to do, doesn't even know how to think about his culture anymore, everything's so crazy in the world, what do I do? And so as he goes into the voting booth, he kind of throws up this prayer, like, Lord, help me see this property, I don't know what to do. And then he pulls the curtain on the voting booth, but instead he's transported into this who knows where place, and suddenly he's in a vision and he sees three people sitting in three chairs in front of him. Mm-hmm. And they are three spirits. Mm-hmm. And they have three very different chairs. 
One's in a... So actually, this is a fiction book. Well, but it's mostly dialogue. It's back and forth. So mm-hmm. then the rest of the book is Christian having a conversation with these three spirits who represent three different ways of thinking about cultural engagement. Ooh. One is the spirit of Exodus. The second is the spirit of exile. And the third is the spirit of incarnation. And so it's him trying to Whoa. figure out at the end of the day, That's who do deep. I, how that do I vote? Deep. How do I think about my culture as a Christian? Which What's spirit right? does he vote for? Uh, there's a, the end, of, and then at the end of the story, not to give anything away, he comes yeah. back to the voting booth and then has to, you know, make his. The, so, I want to read uh, this, and it's not long. It's going to be. It's like half the length of a normal. Did you book, come so. up with this on your own? Totally. Is it set in contemporary times? Yes, or it is. is. It Dickinsonian. No, it's and contemporary set in England. Please in the tell 1890s. me that. Exile is Donald Trump because no, no, I don't. I I, there's really no, there are want no that to happen. There are no actual candidates named because oh. I want people to be able to read this book beyond 2016. Okay, but it does reference contemporary American okay. history. As, so we'll keep people posted when we actually have a name. Yeah, and if anyone has a great idea for a name, well, tell us what is yeah. the sort of working title. Right. Is. It's We're, just right now called the Voting Booth Vision. Yeah, that that's describes what it is. I know. That's not a name. But the subtitle, I forget what that is, but it's a bit yeah, more descriptive okay. about what okay. it is. So we'll work on that. And you I were know. saying it needs to have like a number, like... Three steps to a better life. Right. <laughs> that's how you get people to download ebooks. It is, You make false promises. Well, and that's how... Or- See, and your unwillingness to make false promises is why we're not busting at the seams with success. We... Yes. <laughs> okay. I can't make false promises. They have to trust me. But, but you're absolutely right. That if you go and look at what headlines are, are really on the top of pages now, on yeah. even reputable news sites, it's always, you won't believe what so-and-so did right. here. Or to you make $10,000 a month. Right. Yeah. Or three things that no one told you in kindergarten that's ruining your life or whatever. It's, right. it's that kind of Ten thing. Ten things that Prince learned right before he's passing. Three things that were in Prince's pocket that were not purple <laughs> when he died. Yeah, it's that kind of stuff. Okay. And just, it's clickbait. Okay. Okay. Uh, next week is our 200th episode. That's right, 200 episodes. I cannot believe we have done this know, that many insane. times. We're looking for your questions. We did this at 100. If th- Those of you that are old enough to remember, we did this at 100. Send us your questions. Go to our Facebook page, post questions, or tweet us your questions. This was Jason's idea. Tweet us your questions. Hashtag PV Podcast 200. Is that what I was supposed to say, Jason? Uh-huh. Yeah, Jason says yes. Hashtag PV Podcast 200. Your questions, and we will answer some of them. Not all of them. I would promise you that, but we don't do false promises here like the rest of me. Okay, well, you promised me we could talk about the second thing, but I've forgotten no, what it is. Good. What is it? No, we're not going to talk about it. Okay. Lost. It is his podcast. <laughs> I guess so. Um, uh, big news this week. Big There's news. lots of big news. Which ones are you talking about? DreamWorks. Yeah. Did you hear oh, about DreamWorks? I did hear about this. DreamWorks is now owned DreamWorks by Animation. NBC Universal. Uh, well, Comcast basically. Comcast bought DreamWorks. Comcast ah. also owns NBC Universal. But they okay. bought that recently. It only bought. Com, I mean, DreamWorks Animation. Yes. It didn't it, buy all of DreamWorks. There's no such thing as all of DreamWorks anymore. There isn't? No, no. In fact, DreamWorks, the film studio, is currently owned by Disney. I didn't know that. Yes, that's where uh, Steven Spielberg currently has his production deal is at Disney because Disney bought DreamWorks Pictures. All the rest of DreamWorks, the TV division, the video game division, everything else they shut down because huh. the big... 20 year ago vision failed. So they, they had dramatic. the movie studio, they had the animation studio. Yes. Is there anything else? Nope. It was just those two pieces. That's it. And but so a- the animation, animation studio is now Comcast. Yes. And Universal. the animation studio was the only part that was publicly traded. They split uh-huh. uh, before they went public. Because the other side's owned by Disney. So. Well, it wasn't then. It just okay. uh, the, the, was the only thing that was really actively making stuff. DreamWorks Films is basically Steven Spielberg. And the reason we're talking about this? The reason we're talking about this is because long, long ago, I started a company called Big Idea Productions. Have you heard of it? I don't know. Maybe you have. Maybe you haven't. It involves some vegetables. It went bankrupt. It was bought by Classic Media in New York. Classic Media was then bought by Entertainment Rights in London. Entertainment Rights was then bought 
by the two guys who owned Classic Media and sold it to them. They bought it all back in New York. Classic Media and Entertainment Rights together were then bought by Jeffrey Katzenberg and DreamWorks. And now DreamWorks was just bought by, uh, well, NBC Universal, which had already been bought. Okay. If you, you give a mouse a cookie, <laughs> Universal you know bought NBC, and then um, Comcast bought Universal. So Comcast owns Universal and NBC, and then they just bought DreamWorks. So now Comcast owns all of them. Bottom line, Comcast is like one of my nemesis. Comcast I know. How is can Comcast, huge. you know, not run my internet or my cable very well at all? Because and yet do they you know can how many buy. People want internet and cable. Do you know how many customers they have? Millions. Like, like 25 million. Millions. Yeah. Do you know mm-hmm. how hard it is to answer the phone that many times? <laughs> it's real hard. I mean, you can answer one phone call a day really well. You know, but if you're going to have that many customers, you need to be able to back it up. There are a lot That's of hard. call centers in India. I know. That could handle this. Well, I'm sure they try. <laughs> well. I'm sure they try. So anyway, a few people have asked, what does this mean for Bob and Larry besides the fact that they now work for the cable company? Could they show up at a Universal Studios park? Uh, uh, theoretically. I mean, they could have before. You don't have to be owned to no, you but know, do a, a deal easier. to be at a theme park. The question is, would a Universal Park want to have Christian vegetables wandering around handing out tracts? I'm not so sure. They're that not they handing do. out anything. They don't Wherever have Bob and Larry go, they hand out tracts. Oh. It's their thing. They have little track dispensers built into their arms. And that's not true, people. So if you're listening to this, and a track shoots out. Don't believe Bing! a word he armpit. says. That was my own idea. Uh, I insisted. <laughs> it's no from the wonder very the beginning. company went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so they answered, what does it mean for Bob and Larry? Too soon to tell. Okay. Well, maybe I thought, nothing, I thought maybe everything. not much was happening on the Veggies in the House. Not much is. Well, Veggies in the House is still going, but nothing else it's is, on Netflix. is in production. But how's it doing on Netflix? You, you don't know how anything is doing on Netflix because okay. they won't tell anyone. Oh, they won't? No. It's a black box. The only way you know that you do well, and this is even if you're Steven Spielberg, is if they place another order. Why wouldn't they tell you how your stuff is doing? Because they don't want to reveal any of their own metrics. Why? Because it's secret. Because it's just giving data to their competitors. Uh. Secret. They don't want anyone to know. So anyway, we don't know what it means that Comcast now owns NBC, which now owns Universal, which now owns DreamWorks, which now owns Classic Media, which now owns uh, Big Idea, which owns Bob and Larry. So if you have any customer service questions about anything related to Bob and Larry, you yeah. can just forget it. In fact, it. If, you ha- well, if you have a <laughs> theological question for Bob and Larry to answer, just call Comcast <laughs> Customer Support, and Good they can transfer that. you to the right department. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, Bono has some advice for Christian musicians. All right. What is that? My husband will say... <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, uh, he yeah. hopes it's a way to make it better. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah, he's uh, not a big are, fan. Who are we going to offend now? I, I'm not. That's he, all he, I'm saying. So he doesn't like any Christian music? He He's not a big fan. He likes Third Day. Does he like any music, though? Is he oh, a music yeah. fan? He's oh, a big really? music fan. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought he was just a sports guy. Who do you like? Sports guy. Christian music wise. I like uh, Michael Gunger. I like Audrey Assad. I've been listening to a lot of that. Uh, Third Day has a new worship album that I like a lot. I haven't heard that. Um, I like David Crowder. I like uh, The Brilliance, the other Gunger oh, yeah. that was on our Michael, show. Uh, David Gunger. David Gunger. I like all the Gungers. Pretty much anything You're Gunger a fan related, of the I'm a fan of. Um, I like uh, Grey Haven. I I've never like, even heard of them. You know, there's so That's many. a Tolkien See, reference. You're not even trying. Is it really? Yeah, the Grey Havens. Did you ever read Lord of the Rings? Did yeah. you see the movies? I don't remember. Who are the Grey Havens? Are, are they, the Havens? Did they show up in the movie? It's a place. It's a place. In Middle Earth. <laughs> but it's plural. Yeah, the Grey Havens. A haven is a safe place. So Grey Havens Grey are Havens safe is places. Where you, where you take the final ship across the sea to the undying land. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, that's like, that's the... Oh, Okay. You paid better attention. It sounds like a good. Ba- it sounds like a good band, the Grey Havens. Yeah, they're good. They're, it's a husband wife uh, team. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so Bono. Yeah. What did he say? You know who Eugene Peterson is? Yes. That name's familiar. The Message. Yeah. I've interviewed him a number of times. Pa- okay. Well, so he's the, the writer of the Message. Yeah. Uh, the paraphraser. It's a paraphrase uh, of the Bible. He's written many oh. books. He's written many books. Okay. He's old. Eighty. Plus. He's, he's old. He's old. Yeah. He's old. He's um, Bono is a big fan of Eugene Peterson. 
Okay. Bono, a few years ago in the U.S., wanted to meet with Eugene Peterson, and Eugene Peterson said, not now, I'm busy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's what? totally Eugene Peterson. <laughs> the thing I love about Eugene Peterson when I've interviewed him before is he is at the stage of life, and, and his character is such that he truly just does not give a rip what people think about him hmm. in the most godly way. And yeah. you get amazing interviews out of the guy because he doesn't care. In, in, again, the best way what people think about him. He is just going to say it like it is. So if he doesn't have time for Bono, yeah. I don't have time for Bono. So Bono is a big fan of Eugene Peterson. Is he still a fan even though he wouldn't meet of, with him? Yes, of the, the Psalms, which hmm. have inspired a lot of Bono's songwriting. Interesting. Um, the, hmm, I didn't know you were going to bring this up today, but I have an inside scoop on this. Really? Yeah. That's because he doesn't ever tell us what he's going to talk about. I know. Well, he never gives <laughs> us Oh, I pick it this morning. <laughs> so they Scoop us. Bono and Eugene Peterson did a, a video interview together. Yeah. I'm very good friends with the guy who filmed it. No way. Yes way. We could have him on the podcast. Really? Yeah. And he could tell us what it was like? Yeah. Well, so did they actually meet each other when they did yes. yeah, yeah. together? So, so, so yeah. they, they actually have talked. Face to face. They filmed an interview. Um, and, and this was interesting. The, the result is a short documentary called The Psalms, which was released hmm. last Tuesday. Where can you see this documentary? I don't know. Um, uh, oh, if you click this link. Oh. You can watch a part of it anyway. Click this link. Maybe we Maybe can you put should the send link the article. up on Oh, the yeah. Air. Can you do that, Jason? All right, yeah, great. Yeah, we'll look for that link. But this was interesting, the, the excerpt here, and this was actually, uh, the story was in the Washington Post, so mm. this isn't a Christian uh, story. But in the excerpt of the documentary film shown in the video above, the YouTube frontman offered some advice for Christian musicians. Would you consider him this, a Christian musician? Yes. Bono? Yeah. yeah. Really? He's, well, he's a, Christian. a Christian who's a musician, yeah. and his faith informs his music. But he doesn't make Christian music. Yeah, he does. You think so? How yeah. do you define that? The, well, right, that's lady. the question that I'm asking. He mentions Jesus more often than some contemporary Christian bands I know. Really? Yeah. Well, why isn't he ever on the Christian channels I listen to every now and then? Because they, because he wasn't, he didn't start out on a Christian label, and he acts like a rock star, not like a Christian minister. Yeah, you know, except helping. for saving Africa. Right. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. But acts Christian like a rock star. Don't do that. They travel around and they and they do seminars. Why is it that? <laughs> why do so many celebrity Christian pastors act like rock stars, and now rock stars are acting like pastors? Whoa. Whoa, that's hmm. deep. Because it's all about celebrity. Ultimately, celebrity is the currency that gets your message heard. Sadly. That should be a T-shirt. No, because it would just make us cry when we put it on. Okay, so what were you saying? Okay, um, so uh, I, here's a, a good question: Is why was Bono giving Eugene Peterson advice about Christian music? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why that came up, but I thought this was interesting. Bono said to Eugene Peterson regarding Christian music: I find in Christian art, oh, actually broaden it out, art, a lot of dishonesty. And I think it's a shame. I would love if this conversation would inspire people who are writing these beautiful gospel songs to write a song about their bad marriage. Write a song about how they're pissed off at the government, because that's what God wants from you, Bono said. Why I am suspicious of Christians is because of this lack of realism. Hmm. That's interesting. I've heard that before. I find that hard to argue with. It's hard to argue with, but it's also unlikely to happen. Because if you're a Christian singer-songwriter, you don't get paid for writing about your bad to marriage. Write, to write no about well, now like country pessimist. singers do. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I think but it, we got to go beyond just Christian musicians or artists. We do. I think it's, it's something that plagues a lot of the evangelical subculture in America is there is a lack of authenticity. The, and we've talked about this many times. Yeah. There, there's that feeding on sentimentality rather than the willingness to say, here's the reality of, of not just but we're, faith, but life in general can be very messy. Right. And, and but we, we don't want to talk about that because we think it's bad for publicity. We're honest with the messiness of life, though, because we're all selling our solutions for it. I can clean up your life in three steps. Right, but see, the, even the fact that you're trying to sell a solution is disingenuous because you're ignoring the complexity of the problem by saying in three solution, in three steps, here's your solution. Well, if it's 35 steps, nobody's going to buy my book. <laughs> or if there isn't an easy solution, you don't have a book to sell, which is my dilemma in titling a book because I'm not <laughs> peddling a quick solution. I'm trying to be honest. <laughs> Okay, well, here's the thing that my mind was just wondering. Yeah. If... if 
if like sensationalism and bad things sell, you know, then which is true, you can't argue with that. It gets attention. It gets mm-hmm. attention mm-hmm. and it does sell, which mm-hmm. is why Donald Trump says the things he does mm-hmm. to get everybody's attention. Uh, let me finish. Okay, go ahead. And if if that's the case, then why wouldn't Christian artists be more honest about all the brokenness and bad stuff? I would amend your comment a little bit. Go ahead. I think what Donald Trump is doing and what I think a lot of the Christian marketplace does is it oversimplifies the problems so that it can sell you an overly simplistic solution. Mm. So the problem is Mexican immigrants. The solution is build a wall. Both of those statements are false. Or the problem is you're just not managing your marriage with God's biblical principles, biblical principles and mm-hmm. here are the five biblical principles you need to fix your marriage. It's overly simplistic diagnosis of the problem, an overly simplistic solution that I can sell you for 19.99. Mm-hmm. And I think what Bono is trying to say is, let's talk about the messy complexities of life, and then let's talk about a more genuine solution, which is not something you buy off a shelf. It is the equally complicated but rich relationship with Christ that's offered to us. Well, you can't do in that faith. in a song. <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> See, but the, the other advantage that Bono has that he probably doesn't realize is he has such a platform and an audience now that he could sing right. about anything, and he doesn't have to worry about his, his income. He doesn't right. have to worry about paying the bills. You know, A young pastor who's just starting out is really... It ha- it's hard not to worry about... Your job. Tell me about it. When, when you're <laughs> when you're completely unestablished, a young musician just starting out. Mm-hmm. You want to be a, a Christian artist, so you move to Nashville and you look at who is having success, and they're people that write worship songs that get picked up and sung in churches. Mm-hmm. So because then they get paid for every time they're sung yeah, in church. Yeah. Right. So you then want to write something write that songs gets sung in just church like that. If you, f- you write a song about your divorce, ain't nobody gonna play it. Ain't nobody gonna sing it. You're right. not going to get paid. That only works in country music. There are people, though. There are artists that are doing Christian artists that are doing really, you know, experimental out there work, but they're not trying to sell it in church. Well, they're not trying to make it their vocation necessarily. Mm-hmm. You know, or, well, or how do they make money? They wait. They're waitresses. Oh, they're waiters. Well. They work at Starbucks. Servers, Phil. Servers. Servers. Get politically oh, correct. F- Baristas. Like, servant is very. That's demeaning. We don't have waitresses and waiters anymore. We have servers. So we don't want people to wait on us. We want and we don't have to serve us. We don't have stewardesses. We have flight attendants. Yeah. We don't have manholes. We why have is serv- people why portals. Why is server better than waiter? Exactly. Because it's gender neutral. We have servers and servresses. <laughs> ha ha. Now it's not Servettes. gender neutral. <laughs> <laughs> servers and servettes. Okay. I like that. So uh, we can be honest, and we should be honest. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating against honesty, but you also have to be honest to say the more honest you are, in many ways, the less likely you are to make a boatload of money so or even calling, a sustainable living. Y- yeah, or you're he, saying the economics wrong. aren't there. No, I'm saying he's, he's right, but I don't think he understands. People aren't necessarily choosing. To not be honest, I see what you're saying. They're choosing to make the songs that their record label wants them to make because yeah. they the need market, to make a living. Yeah, because they are trying yeah. to pay. And the, the same bills. thing goes in publishing and in politics and in a number of other places. The people who are really trying to be authentic and honest and wise and deep don't get the platform. It's sad, but it's true. Yeah, it's funny though that it's funny the difference between songs. And books, uh, because other than 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, I can't think of any songs with a number in the title. <laughs> but like every other book. Well, most people don't days. listen to music for self-help. I know, I know. That's, yeah. So music is a very different yeah. thing than reading a book, or, and especially mm-hmm. e-books. E-books are very transactional. You know, you want to know how to build a better website. 12 steps. Oh, and by the right way, here. if you get my new ebook, which isn't out yet and doesn't have a title, you will walk away with a clear answer on which path is the right one. Really? For cultural. Oh, yeah. I'm not leaving you hanging. Will well, maybe, le- you should, maybe you should put that in the title. Will it lead me to happiness? 
Guaranteed. Will it increase my income? <laughs> Absolutely. It might mind so does it increase, increase my income. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this. Does yeah. doing these little ebooks affect your income at all? Seriously? I mean, uh, the, how can you a make tiny bit. Here's, on that? here's what I'm trying. I'm trying to throw a whole bunch of darts up on the wall to see what hits, right? So, so you've I'm got your devotion. Doing devotion. I'm doing ebooks. I got a, a regular book in the works. I'm, I'm speaking. I'm doing some consulting work, but it's just trying to get all of that to the place of actually being able to support my family, which is kind of... Why don't you just go get a job? I know, seriously. I may end up doing that. I'm, I'm going to be the barista at Starbucks who doesn't drink Maybe coffee. Maybe we should just market this podcast. As a what? As a podcast. Ten steps for... <laughs> I don't know. Lots, what, of, other, what problem lots of other podcasts make quite a good living. Really. What, what problem are we trying to solve with this like podcast? Like a half of 1% of podcasts. Yeah, why are we doing this podcast? That's this a question for the, the 200th episode. Of the 199th podcast. All right, go ahead. Okay, okay. This is what I wanted to talk about actually like five weeks ago. I wanted to talk about the middle class. But then our friend Franklin Graham gave me an even better reason to talk about this topic. Uh, I got a tweet from Franklin Graham, which is funny. No, you did not. Because I don't follow Franklin Graham. He somebody, tweeted you? Somebody no. retweeted? No, it was a promoted tweet. Oh, really? Yeah. So he, he paid. paid. He paid money for me to get this tweet. Oh. So I'm not picking on Franklin Graham. I'm just saying mm -hmm. if he's going to pay money so that I read his tweet, then I might as well read it on my podcast. You, you might as well. That's yes. giving him free tweet exposure. Yes. But we've given him <coughs> lots of free exposure. Yeah, not, not a lot of positive. Not the kind he wants. Yes. But. Okay. Franklin Graham's tweet. Follow if you agree. Oh. This is just like a note you pass in class in yes. third grade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Check yes or no. Yes. Do you like me? This is me? the level of our cultural dialogue now. <laughs> Follow if you agree. Ugh. There's only one with a capital O. That's a hint. Mm. <laughs> There's only one who can ultimately make America great again, and it's not a political party. It is Almighty God. Well, I have a problem with that. <laughs> There's so much in that I have to unpack. <laughs> we, could do a whole we could do a whole podcast we could on do, that. No, a whole other like, show just called Unpack the Tweet. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, okay, so, he's, it's, so there's a certain sense that He's distancing himself from Donald Trump, who yes. says, I am the one who can make America great again. Right. Roar, beating his chest like a mm -hmm. great orange gorilla. Um, so he's distancing himself from Donald Trump. So you say, OK, OK, good. I'm with you there. Mm -hmm. But now he's saying, I agree with his goal, though. Right. That's the and problem. And his assessment. His assessment is America used to be great. Mm -hmm. Now it's not great. We want it to be great again. And there, we keep saying that, and no one ever stops to say, what do you mean by great? What kind of great was America that it isn't any longer? You can insert whatever you want into it, which is what makes it such a potent political well, slogan. Well, I mean, when what? you stop and you think about... In the past, what yes. we had along with our greatness, yeah, we're talking about Slaves. slavery, <laughs> right? Well, we're, we're talking it, about even, even Donald Trump when he says America, America used to be great. We used to win. Okay, that's Arnold win. Schwarzenegger. I don't care. <laughs> no, now that's Paul Grape. Grape. <laughs> America used to be great. We would win, win, win. Now it's Bernie Sanders. Now we lose, lose, lose. Why can't I go to college for free? That's pretty good. I should be able to go to college for free. <laughs> okay. What what are we talking what what period of time are we looking at the 1950s? Are we looking at the 1920s? 80s. Donald Trump pointed all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt at one point. Said that's when America was really great. What? Was Teddy Roosevelt. I don't even know if he knows who Teddy Roosevelt is, but that's beside the point. And, and, and even so, okay, so for Franklin I think Graham. I think they're referencing the 80s, honestly. The I, 80s I, were miserable. Uh, we were in a huge recession in the 80s. People, people, look back to the, the recession? people look back to the 80s, honestly, with this golden hue we, that I'm guilty of myself at times. Yeah, but I'm well, just the saying. the end of the 80s. Yeah. Well, the, think about it. The 80, I was a kid in the 80s. So it's, you have shut that. Up. I, I was. <laughs> I don't need to be reminded of that. Let's see, I was, I was 4 to 14 <laughs> in the 80s. Well, but you, we had Michael Jackson. We had the the '84 games in Los Angeles. <laughs> we had the Cold War, just to make us feel yeah. superior. New York was a horrible dive with high crime. Los Angeles was buried in smog. You couldn't breathe in Los Angeles in the '80s. 
There's so man th- between the the big hair and the shoulder pads. But the thing was, the '70s were so bad. Yeah, the '70s like the were '70s bad. were so bad. Yeah. That in comparison, the '80s seemed amazing. And it was also the the decade of MTV. And and, yeah. and Wall Street. There was Street an greed. explosion Street, yeah. in Wall Street greed. greed in, and, in the and, term, in the reference of Gordon Gecko, greed is good. That well, was and the this 80s. is where like, Donald generation. Trump yes. sort of had his birth, yes, really. He did. And that's why I think, and that was like, you know, he there was a period when he went into bankruptcy in the mid 90s, yeah, I think maybe mid, it is. Near the end but, of the 80s, but this was like his big, big boom and beginning. So when yeah. I think he, when he thinks about that, I think that's what he's thinking of. And it's also when Chuck Norris was really in his heyday. Mother knows. <laughs> what What are you gonna say? He's talking about after World War Two. After World War Two, like the fifties. Trump is. Do you think Trump is talking about the fifties? I think he's talking about the spirit after World War Two. Okay. And there yeah. was the spirit well, after World War Two. That's what Peter Jennings is talking about when he talks about the greatest. No, generation. that's Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw. Tom. Peter Jennings is Canadian and dead. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> is he? Is Peter Jennings dead? Yeah, he, he died. died. Lung cancer. I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. Okay, sorry. But, but, but We're going to take a moment of silence for <laughs> Peter Jennings, everyone, and I'm sorry I referenced him posthumously. Tom Brokaw, Greatest Generation. Yeah. He's talking yeah. about the World War II, the, right. the generation that grew up in, in the Depression. Was America great during the Depression? I mean, how are we defining no, 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 great? No, no. Our greatness was being formed in the crucible okay, of Okay, the... and then we won World War II. Right. Woo-hoo. Right. That and was then great. When everybody came back. I think we can all agree that that was great. That was great. That we won yes. World War II. Yes, that was really great. And we helped rebuild Europe. Which right. was kind and generous, and in our own self-interest. Is that what we? Yes, because it, it created markets for us that our well, companies then dominated. But, and, the, and the, as Eisenhower talked about, the military-industrial complex that was created to win World War II ended up cata- industrial catapulting revolution. us yeah. into the into the Cold War with a massive industrial mm-hmm. complex that mm-hmm. created the space I still race. Have an industrial and, complex. I can't go into a warehouse without. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it created this huge economic boom and all the jobs, and you had the baby boom and all that. Well, and, and you youth had all this emerged. new, ha- like suburbs, su- suburbs, <laughs> suburbs. Is that the French pronunciation? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> suburbs were born then. You yes, know, you started yes, having these yes. wonderful, you know, suburbs and families. And okay. there was, you know, so okay, but, so do we agree that that's what they're talking how about? How do we think Donald Trump defines great in terms because he just oh, finds he, it in, economic. I think he defines it in economic terms. But here's another thing you had. If I can add one more piece, which I think might relate to not just how Trump is defining great, but also um, Bernie Sanders and a lot of people who support both of them is after World War II, you had the GI Bill yeah. in which really created the middle class. You had all these soldiers coming back from the war, getting educated on the government's dime, and getting these and then middle getting class jobs, jobs. All the big American companies that were growing exactly. because of the markets we, we had were this rebuilding in Europe. Massive and in middle the US. class, which most yeah. of our parents probably grew up in. Yeah. And <clears throat> a lot of people look back at that time as a positive so one. Is and now that the greatness. I think a lot of it was, and that's what a lot of people are lamenting, is the middle class, as you will probably get to finally, is <laughs> is really, we really, hope. really struggling. Yeah. Okay. So then when Franklin Graham says, only God can make America great again, what, what does, does he, he mean? mean? I, M- moral? Or Christian? Yeah, probably. Probably just like it's not as Christian as it used to be. Yeah. And Wouldn't it, that it, go back to the 50s too? Uh, Cause is it, could only God make Sweden great again? Or does this apply singularly to America? Are there any, in Franklin Graham's view, are there any great countries currently? We can't answer that. I'd be scared. No, we, we can speculate wildly. I, I, I imagine <laughs> if there's a country that he thinks is following some, his ideals of what biblical morality would be, he would say yes, but I don't know where that would be. So I, we, I, that wasn't my so bell, by the way. They're, they're sportier. <laughs> Phil, Phil. I just started, accidentally started a podcast somehow. Oh, it's because I pressed Are the wrong button. Are you bored with ours? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to someone else's podcast while we're doing our You're podcast. cheating on us. Okay. I don't honestly don't know what Franklin Graham is referring to. Mm-hmm. I assume it would be the age where his father was on the cover of Time and being heralded, you know, meeting presidents because Christianity was in such a privileged mm-hmm. position. This is at the 1970s? Uh, 60s. 60s, 70s. 60s, more 60s early 60s. Because things started going crazy. It, you know, 68 economically was the high water mark for America. 19, it was also 1968. Was it really? Crazy yeah. economically and politically. Yes. And then things started to go. 
go. F- so, but- you know, I, I honestly think, sorry, <laughs> I honestly think that basically he's just trying to make a big point. I think his. I big, don't know what his point is. His point is basically, I think, against Donald Trump. That I think, Donald Trump's an idiot. Like I think what I he's think saying. He's, I think. I, don't think, I, think well, I do. If I can defend, and I don't agree with if him. If I can defend Franklin Graham, you're going to defend him. I'm going to Go defend him. I think his point is, don't put your trust in Donald Trump. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. That's, yes, probably but, true. But if your goal, your ultimate goal, is. The greatness of America. Right. That's where he goes That's off the rails. Where a little bit. we're just I don't know why he's yeah. even talking about that. Why if if you're a pastor, why you're tweeting about how to make America great again? Because that's you're supposed to be focusing on the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of men. Why don't you tweet mm-hmm. him that? Yeah, I will so but I'll <laughs> have to pay, 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 I'll have to, to, pay new, yeah. to get in front of him. Okay. One of the things that worries me about about the Make America Great Again is that m- when many people point in the past what the greatness was when you actually pull it apart, especially if it's economically, it's that we were so far ahead of everyone else. Mm-hmm. It's our greatness. Comparative. Yes. Right. Our greatness was comparative, and it was dependent on other nations being, being low. more regressive, you know, way, way behind us. So if we have the highest standard of living, that means we are great. Mm-hmm. If we don't have the highest standard of living, we're no longer great. And we need to return to our greatness, which you can do either by really driving your own standard of living or doing things that kind of undercut the standard of living of other people. Because So here's what I wanted to get into. Are you turning into a socialist on this podcast? <laughs> it's starting to sound that way. Go ahead. No. Okay. So the middle class, because like you said, you go back 50 years, uh, what really differentiated America from the rest of the world was the size of our middle class. And this is ultimately why the communist leaders got so frustrated, because we were... Uh, communism had no appeal to Americans because it wasn't the aristocracy and then everyone else. There was this huge middle class that was we very We still have happy. a huge middle class, but it's just their girth. <laughs> it's I, per capita. I fit just, in that demographic I, I that do you too. just disparaged. They're huge. Okay, thank you very much for that. In more than one um, way. So what we have now is we have, and, and this this may sound socialist, but it's not. As income inequality increases, civil unrest increases. Well, look at what happened in Greece. What? Yeah, I mean, that's hap- <laughs> well, that's kind of happening everywhere. No, that's happening everywhere. Oh, oh you mean like with austerity? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay, yes. I mean... Where, well, look at the Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah. That's, and to a certain extent, the Tea Party movement yep. is the same, where people feel left out. Like all the success is going to that group over there, you get more civil unrest. And this is what Donald Trump is about. But it's also what Bernie Sanders is about. That's what's so odd. Their yeah. campaigns are so similar. pushing the same thing. Just different way to the get system there. system is shutting you out. You should get back in to the system. <laughs> but the irony is... I can is, get you in. I have a golden ticket. But that's what's funny is Donald Trump is the poster child for that. Being inside the system. Yeah. 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 I mean, Bernie Sanders is inside the system as a political elite, but he's not exactly... Because, because Donald Trump ultimately isn't concerned... He's concerned about winning. Right. And so he and he self-identifies with America. So if America is a loser, he kind of feels like a loser. Are you doing psychoanalysis on so, Trump? Yes. So <laughs> if I can make America a winner, then I feel like a winner. And if I can say things that get everyone else to follow me, then I can make America a winner because I know how, because I learned from the Bible an eye for an eye. Which he finally revealed as his favorite Bible verse. No, he did which not. He read he did. Two Corinthians. When was this? Oh yeah, he's a think, few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. <clears throat> yeah. he, he said, "I know, I got it. I'm going to do Bernie Sanders as Donald Trump from here on out, just to confuse people." Okay, we are seeing the effects of globalization, the effects of American ingenuity on the entire world. What are from, you reading? Me. This is you. Yeah, I'm reading me talking. This. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. Is that allowed? These are your notes? I wrote some things down oh. to read them. Okay. Is are you serious? Are you kidding? No. 
you're not serious. What? <laughs> Usually when you go into that tone, you're reading an article We're from We're seeing some... the effects of globalization, the effects of American ingenuity on the entire world. From 1900 until about 1970, American ingenuity was great for America. Now that's rippled out to be great for the entire world. So the whole world, the standard of living, I mean, if you say, is the world doing better? There are fewer people in poverty as a percentage today than ever before. It's very right. true. So whole classes of people are lifting out of mm-hmm. poverty by things like technology, by better health care, by the fact that even if you can't afford a TV or a computer, you can have a smartphone and you can start a small business. Uh, so there's all sorts of stuff going on where people are being buoyed out of poverty around the world. The problem is all that benefit to the rest of the world is no longer exclusively benefiting Americans, especially unskilled Americans. So what Donald Trump is doing... Differently skilled. you got to be politically correct. Differently. Skill challenged. Is that... Otherly skilled. Otherly skilled? Alternatively well, skilled. Well, in, in, the, in the market of marketplace. Okay. Of, okay. Trump is winning by promising easy and false solutions to very complex problems. That was my point. That's exactly what I said. Yes. Great minds think alike. And I've written it down before. So, so you really uh, But I came writing, up with it on the fly. You're really reading what you wrote? Yeah. I did. I, I thought you were allowed? kidding. It is, That's but you Stephen, should say, I thought I'm it's, reading it's, what I it's said. It's what Stephen Colbert does every night. He okay. writes stuff down, and then he reads it off the teleprompter. I just don't have a teleprompter. Actually, I do, but it's over there, um, and I don't use it for this. So, okay, so let's talk about the middle class. All right. Because, and this is what experts have woken up to. It says, we have really ignored the fact of just how hard it is for the middle class nowadays. Can, is there a definition to of the middle experts? class? That's a great oh, question. Like what what is qualifies the as middle class? The class that is in the middle. Well, uh, there is a technical <laughs> low income threshold that yeah. the yeah. federal government yes. says. So I, I'm assuming that it would be higher than that. And we probably can't say lower class anymore. That's probably it's not differently classed. Correct. It's it's class challenged. Yeah. They so don't, they don't have class. No class. So no class. Uh, the people in that. V- well, let's put it a different a, okay. a different way. We are now in. We're not in a manufacturing economy anymore. America is a uh, knowledge or information economy. Okay. The people that do well, do well, not because of what they do with their hands, but because of what they do with their heads. That That's because and, we've... And I'm not referring to football. <laughs> That's because we farmed out all of those manual jobs to... Oh, you're jumping ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, so here's something that happened, because Donald Trump, what did he say about Apple? Because he's going to solve all of our problems. Oh, he's going to get them to manufacture the phones yes. in America again. Yes, when right? I'm president, they will manufacture everything in America. That would be great jobs. And You'll all have great jobs. And every phone is costing $15,000. Make, making iPhones and MacBooks. Okay, so I want to go back. There was a guy, because this is what's changed in the last uh, f- uh, 30 year, 20 years, we'll say. By the way, we've lost, uh, America has lost 6 million manufacturing jobs since 2008. I think, Phil, is this like really? your, this sounds like your stump speech, like you're about to run for office <laughs> or announce that you're going to be a candidate. Really? Yes. Since, so when our economy tanked, yes. people Six, started shipping jobs out? No, no, they'd already been doing it. But how many of those jobs went to China? Because China's the boogeyman. Very, very few. China, few. few. 700,000 out of the 6 million went yeah. to China. Um, Mexico. M- most... No, uh, uh, 200,000 went to Mexico. Hmm, okay. Where'd all the others go? Hmm. Canada. Canada? Decreased demand and automation. Yeah. Oh, automation. We don't need as much anymore because guess what? We're in a recession and people aren't buying, so we lay off, we shut well, down Well, nobody's factories. talking about that. I heard an interesting argument. Yes. About the, you know, everyone's debating whether we should raise the minimum wage. Yes. And food service workers like... Fast food workers are all arguing, you know, $15 minimum wage, all that. And, and one analyst came along and said, okay, if you raise the minimum wage that high, very, very quickly you are going to see automated fast food restaurants mm-hmm. where people are no longer back there. Well, McDonald's is testing them. Right, because you can get a machine to do it right. and your food will pop Have out. Have I ever told you about the auto nut roller? <laughs> no. Is this like buy it on TV? A friend kind of, of mine worked at Kraft. Uh, have you ever seen a cheese ball covered yeah. in nuts? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They have it there for parties. They're delicious. You get a cheese ball. It's covered in nuts. You get a cracker, a little knife. You take some cheese. You put it on your cracker. Yeah. There used to be a factory in Chicago 
that made cheese balls. And, and there was a guy that rolled them. No, He's there the nut were roller. Polish women. Polish women. There were Polish women that stood, and there was a table covered in nuts, and they picked up the cheese balls, and they rolled them around in the nuts until they did, were completely coated. Did you have to be Polish? All, all uh, menial uh, laborers in Chicago are Polish. <laughs> well, a huge population. Um, the Polish women would roll them around and then set them on the conveyor belt. This was fine. Good work for the Polish women. They liked it. Most, actually, people who clean offices in, in Chicago are Polish women. You'll discover if you have an office that needs cleaning. And I apparently won't discover that. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, there was a problem. The, the Polish women rolling the cheese balls. Want to raise. It, no, it's a repetitive motion. They got bored. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel. Oh. They kept getting carpal tunnel syndrome. So they're trying to make arm braces for them. They're trying to figure out how do we not destroy the wrists of all these beloved Polish women. And they finally realized, you know, the only solution to this, we need to make a machine that does this. And so they invented the auto nut roller. And the auto nut roller does that job without getting carpal tunnel syndrome. No Polish women were injured anymore, and they all lost their jobs. So losing their jobs was better than having They saved their wrists, wrists. and lost their jobs. Yeah. And you repeat that about 100,000 times. Right. Um, okay, there was a guy in business school. This is the other thing that's happened, which is, and I'm, I assume Donald Trump is aware of this. Apple doesn't actually make anything. Right. They, right. they make nothing. There was a guy in business school who came up with an idea. This was back in the 70s uh, for a shoe company. And he said, all we're going to do is design and manufacture, uh, sorry, design and market shoes. We don't actually need to make the shoes. Okay. I think there are manufacturers in Asia that we can contract with to actually make the shoes so we don't have to own a factory. Mm -hmm. We don't have to employ any factory workers. All we could do is just, because that's the profitable parts. The profitable parts are the branding, the designing, and the marketing, and the selling, the manufacturing. I think that there are enough manufacturers in Asia now where that's a commodity. And he wrote this paper and he said, I want to start this company. That was Phil Knight, mm -hmm. and the company was Nike. So that's where Nike came from. Nike makes nothing, has never made anything. Hmm. It's one of the biggest uh, you know, American success stories. And you think, well, they employ tens of thousands of people. Yes, but they're all knowledge workers in the U.S. Right. And they contract out everything else because the knowledge work is the high value work. It's what Americans do better than anyone else. Okay, so now you go over to Apple. Apple, when it started, Steve Wozniak was soldering circuit boards right. in the back room. It grew. They did the Apple II. They had to build a factory. They've now got, in California, they got workers putting together computers. Steve Jobs, okay, they launched the Mac. Steve Jobs gets canned. He says, well, I'm going to do it again. So he starts next computer, his new company, and he raises a ton of money because he's Steve Jobs, and then he builds a big factory because that's what he wants to do it right. So he builds his own factory. It's gorgeous. It's all white and pure and, and stylish. He, he employs all of these factory workers in California to build the next computer. He figures he'll need to probably sell about 50,000 a month. So they build a factory to do 50,000 computers a month. And they finally roll out the computer. It's way too expensive. And it sells 5,000 a month. And he's got this huge factory with all these people standing around with nothing to do. And it burns through all of his money and basically kills the company. He has to sell the factory. And the only thing he realizes of value that he has is the software is the stuff that they just made with their minds, not that they were making with their hands. Apple needs the software, so they buy his company to get the software. They don't want the factory. He actually sells the factory to Canon. Um, he goes back to Apple and brings this new thinking when he realizes what killed my company was employing, was owning a factory. I never want to own another factory. And they're now enough, thanks to, ironically, Bill Gates and IBM, and what they did was say, hey, we've got software and a system for making a PC, and we are going to let anyone license it. And that meant that all the, the knowledge work is done for you, and all you have to do is put together PCs, which the first ones came from Dell in Texas and Gateway in South Dakota. But pretty soon they were coming from Japan and then China and South Korea. And Asia got really good at manufacturing electronics. So when Steve Jobs comes back to Apple, he says, we don't need factories anymore. Hey, everybody, we don't need factories. We just want to design things and market things. And we'll have other people build them. That built the modern Apple, which is all, everything's built by someone else. Foxconn. Foxconn. 
Two N's at the end. Foxconn. That? Yes. That's the company in China that builds... Foxconn oh. builds iPhones. They employ a million people just building iPhones. Really? They yeah. have one factory... W- what? They have, they have one factory that has 300,000 workers at it. And they have nets outside the windows to prevent people from committing suicide. They Seriously? Have, Seriously. They have to... That They had to build dormitories to house all these workers, all these Chinese workers, because they were coming in from rural lifestyle to get new jobs in manufacturing to become part of the middle class in in China. Um, But it was pretty depressing work. You're just sitting, you know, 10 hours a day assembling iPhones for two bucks an hour, I think. And so they were going to the roofs of the dormitories and throwing themselves off to their deaths. Oh, that's such a depressing story. So how do you solve that problem? Put nets on the windows. Our workers are killing themselves. Do we need to raise the, the pay? Do we need to give them more recreational opportunities? Let's put nets around the dormitory buildings to catch them. That's honestly what they did. I've seen pictures mm-hmm. of the nets hanging off That's the true. sides of the buildings. Um, ironically, Foxconn is not a Chinese company. When you say the Chinese have taken all of our jobs, uh, Foxconn is in Singapore or Taiwan, one or the other. Well, if it's Singapore, that's still kind of China. And well, Taiwan. They're, they're all kind of China. used to be China. But they're not Chinese national companies. Right. So, <clears throat> uh, so there's a million Chinese people making iPhones, which Donald that Trump a lot. says he wants to bring all that back. Which would kill Apple because they'd say, "Okay, can anyone?" Because they don't make their own stuff. Not to they'd mention say, a lot of American workers. They'd say, <laughs> they'd say, "Can anyone make these for us?" There's no American company that could make them, so they would be out of business. Uh, so the problem is, is that the work that can be done by people who aren't in the knowledge economy has decreased just massively. Um, and, and Foxconn is now trying to solve the problem. Their next solution is we need robots that can do this. So, and, and now, so the same thing yes. that happened in America same mm-hmm. thing that is the, going to happen the, overseas. The auto nut roller Asia. and the Polish ladies in Chicago is next going to happen to the middle class and the, in the lower okay. middle well, class. What is the, you so, know what? You're making me more depressed than listening to well, Donald that, Trump. Okay, so what Phil's explaining <laughs> is, is, all, hard to do. is all really good and most uh, informed political leaders anyway, are aware of this dynamic and problem. I say most because Donald Trump clearly isn't. Um, The big dilemma is we know these jobs have disappeared. We know they're not coming back. It isn't a matter of just getting factories to come back to the United States because they don't yeah. yeah so even, what, even if they come back, right. they'll employ a tenth of the people the, they would have 50 years the ago problem because is, of automation. The problem is not that factories have left America. The problem is that the entire economy has changed. Has, has left... Um, manufacturing. Yes, yeah. m- manual laborers. So what do you do? How do you, how do you reinvigorate yeah, what's a the middle solution? class? I heard one, one expert on NPR saying, and he was talking about automated driving. You know, right, that, that's going to be that the next thing. Three million workers would be displaced if fully automated driving. Right, all the truck drivers, over. taxi drivers, all, I mean, it goes on yeah. and on. His position was we have to come up with a way to give people money even if they have no jobs because <laughs> there just won't be the jobs. Oh, gosh. <laughs> like there's, not, that, what, there's nothing for okay, them to do. So there's that, nothing for them to that do. That brings me back to the redeeming work sermon that I heard yesterday, which was redeeming that, non-work. Well, it's that redeeming. God created us to work. I know. I know. And, and we feel a sense of purpose and value and that we're creating, you know, that we're fulfilling what God created us to do when we work. So that's why, you know, we, we will we're going to need find nets off of all of our buildings. things to do, you know, and, and in many cases that may be, cities deciding, you know what, we're not going to automate this. You know, we're going to take our, our giant sweet street sweeper off the street and hire, you know, 20 people to actually sweep the streets. That always reminds me of Portland, Oregon. I think we've talked about this before, which is you know, generally seen as a very liberal city. And I've been there a number of times, rental cars, and you're not allowed to pump your own gas in Portland, Oregon. Hmm. They still employ people to come out and pump your gas. And it's partly just to keep the jobs because mm-hmm. they want people to have jobs. Do they still make people roll roll their cheese ball nuts by hand? 
I think everyone is vegan, so there's no cheese allowed <laughs> in, in the city. Okay, well, I've, we honestly the the problem. I mean, the biggest minds on earth are wrestling with that problem of what what you do with with manual laborers when there's no manual labor. Well, I I wonder. What I wonder is, will people? Think about the end of Wally with all the people in their little, their super mm. big golf, easy chairs. But will people want to do menial jobs after they've had no jobs at all? So right now, everybody, right. you know, nobody wants to do the menial jobs. And so they are going to immigrants who desperately want jobs, you know, or right. who are, right? right? And so what if we get to the point where this middle class that's no longer really the middle class is... The middle class is going to get smaller. More people are pulled up into the upper class and pushed down into the lower class. Which is not good for so social then we're stability. Gonna... No, which is not good for civil unrest. Did you see the report? It was a week or two ago that came out. Uh, I forget what agency. Maybe it was the CDC. But suicide rates in the United States. Have you, nope. did you yeah. see this? Yeah. It's incredibly They're disturbing. They're exploding among white males. Right. Right. And the type of middle class yeah. laborers that you're describing, the other demographic that shot up by 200 percent was teenage girls mm. suicide rates among teenage girls and there's got to be a correlation there to like social media yeah. and digital technology but this is this is the dynamic is the middle class and they're angry they're upset and it makes sense why a voice like a trump or a sanders depending on your political right. leanings would be seen as very attractive and there's a great article by andrew sullivan which maybe we'll talk about next week because yeah. we're out of time for this week but i want to go back to what what is a christian's attitude towards this great thank you because uh, agitating, following easy solutions isn't a good response. You know, it's anyone who can offer, who says they can solve this problem, I'm just going to blindly follow them. Not a good response. So we can't solve the problem necessarily, but we still have to have an attitude in the midst of it. And I came up with three things. Okay. Three things that we could do. What are That's they? very sellable, Phil. I know. You should market that. <laughs> Give me your email address. I'll tell you what they are. Uh, number one, we can lead by example. We can show contentment in all circumstances because there's a pretty good chance for a lot of us our standard of living is going to to decline. That's kind of the reality of where we are. The huge gulf in living standards between the American middle class and the rest of the world is shrinking rapidly. This is the new normal. In other words, the American middle class is actually declining as the rest of the world's middle class rises. Um, we hate that because our then we don't feel great again. Yeah, that we're not as we're we're not way ahead of them. This is the new normal. Can we show our neighbors how to be happy with less? Yeah. Mm. I was just saying, what, what's really disturbing, I know a lot of people don't travel internationally, but I think a lot of Americans would be shocked if they went to some countries that they assume are very poor, yeah. and they look at how a lot of those people are living and come to the shocking reality that, oh my gosh, there's parts of their life that's actually better than mine, like, and, I, and I'm an American. Um, access to health care in certain countries, education is mm -hmm. way better in some... And I'm not talking like highly developed countries. I'm not talking about England or Canada. I'm talking... You can go to places in... Panama, India, Central America, um, the Middle East, and the schools, the healthcare, the airports, the infrastructure, the roads. You're are starting to sound like Bernie Sanders. They're way better than a lot of places in we America. We gotta be more like India. <laughs> they got everything figured out except the cows. Okay, <laughs> number two. Number one, lead by example. Show contentment in all circumstances. Number two, advocate for the truly poor. Very few of us are truly poor, especially if you're driving your car right now listening to my podcast on your smartphone. <laughs> but poverty does exist in America in ever-increasing numbers. Do we care? Can we help? Stop complaining about our own state and help those that really need our help. And then number three, remember that our purpose on earth is not to increase our standard of living. Life is not about economics. Christians can be joyful even if their houses are smaller than their parents' houses, if their paychecks are smaller than their parents' paychecks. In the world's economy, declining wealth is reason is is uh, in the world's economy, declining wealth is reason for panic and revolution. In God's economy, it's no big deal. Uh, we can show the world that you can be happy with less, even if we're not great in economic terms. Okay, so my mic drop. Things. <laughs> Drop your ukulele and just walk away, Phil. What, you had to say something? Well, I, I think for those of us who grew up middle class or upper middle class or upper class who had a very good standard that was of living. none of us here at the table. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it, you're, you're, that last point of yours is a valid one that, okay, maybe we're not going to make as much money or have homes as big or whatever as our parents did, and that's okay. 
The flip side of it, though, is part of the American narrative has been if you are not middle class, if you are poor, if you are the child of immigrants who came here with nothing, there's opportunity. You can go up. And I think it's mm -hmm. much harder for people who've never had that stuff to say, you never will. You're never going to get better because the economy is so uh, stalled that it's just never going to happen. It's, it's one thing for me to say, my dad, I remember when I was a little kid, he had a Ford Fiesta a little yellow Ford Fiesta that I would barf in every time he drove us anywhere. And I remember when just I... Just to spite him, you'd barf in No, I just, he Ford drove Fiesta. he drove badly and I barfed oh. all the time in that car. It didn't have air conditioning, <laughs> it was bad. And I remember when he traded in that car and got a Mercedes Benz. Oh. And it was this diesel, cheapest Mercedes Benz he could get. He was a doctor and it was like he had spent years and years and years working hard, school, debt, all that. And, and it was like, wow, he, made, he came into this country literally with enough money in his pocket to call my mom on a payphone to pick him up at the airport. That was it. Hmm. So it was one of those American dream kinds of stories. And I I don't have a Mercedes Benz. I will never have a Mercedes Benz. I cannot afford a Mercedes Benz. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. I don't right. need a Mercedes right. Benz. Right. But it's different when you tell a kid who doesn't have anything, who, who lives in a bad neighborhood, who didn't get a good education or, mm -hmm. or is struggling in education, to say, and by the way, you'll you forget ever getting a Ford Fiesta because you're not going to get there either. It's different what end of the spectrum mm -hmm. you're looking at these events from. And right. I, I'm not probably going to lament it as much as somebody who is stuck where they are. Well, lucky you. But we, I, 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 non-immigrant descendants, mm -hmm. We, we believe the lie that if you're in America, things will only go up. Yeah. Because right. we, that's the magic, magic, Disney, magic, that doesn't happen for any other country on earth except ours. Mm -hmm. That's why we're exceptional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What rhymes with exceptional? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Deceptional. Ooh. <laughs> Have you been listening to rhetoric deceptional about America forever being exceptional only in the terms economical that will be better than um, everyone else if we keep working and thinking and watching TV and beer drinking. We'll be ahead of all the uh, poor little countries that are thinking they could someday be like us. Well, I once watched a movie about a donkey named Gus, and it taught me a thing or two about trust. <laughs> I did watch a movie about a donkey named Gus. as a Disney film. <laughs> oh, oh, I remember that one. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. Gus, the field goal kicking yes, mule. Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> That's the American dream right there. <laughs> we can aim a little higher than money. I'm telling you, honey. <laughs> you might not think my story is funny, but our neighbors are looking to us to be uh, examples of living in trust to God. Not too shabby and, there, Phil. And Gus the field goal kicking mule. <laughs> All right, so uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and send in your questions uh, for the 200th episode. And Hashtag PV Podcast 200. Thanks for being here. See you next time. Bye, Bye guys. everybody.